Before Mrs. Thatcher was elected leader of the Conservative Party, she had hardly travelled overseas, let alone expressed enthusiasm for foreign affairs. In contrast, by the time she left office, the Prime Minister had secured herself a place in the pantheon of great international leaders and almost single-handedly restored Britain's standing in the world. It was an exceptional achievement and one that would see her favourable reputation abroad at times very much at odds with her ratings at home. But how did the daughter of a provincial councillor become a dominant player on the world stage? Mrs Thatcher's first appointment as Foreign Secretary was Lord Carrington. A grandee, he was far from being a Thatcherite, but the partnership between Mrs Thatcher and Lord Carrington would prove to be one of the most successful of her first term in office. Their opening salvo in the world arena was the signing of the Lancaster House Agreement, ending minority rule and giving Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, independence. It awarded Mrs Thatcher a diplomatic triumph within her first year of office. There had been an election, unfortunately, which uh, Mr. Smith and uh, Muzarewa won, but of course it, the problem was that uh, neither, uh, neither Mugabe nor Makomo had taken part in the election, and therefore it was hardly representative of what was happening in, in, uh, in Rhodesia, or what the Rhodesians, black Rhodesians wanted. Uh, the, the problem was that uh, the Conservative Party had very nearly committed itself to accepting that election if it was free and fair. And I think the consequences of that would have been disastrous. And I thought it was necessary to have another go at trying to find a settlement in which everybody was involved. But the agreement was also notable as it put Mrs Thatcher at odds with some of the very people who helped place her in power members of the Rhodesia lobby who thought the Prime Minister and her Foreign Secretary were acting irresponsibly. The right wing of the Conservative Party, which was the sort of, in a, in a way, the sort of rump of the Suez group, who were much the same thing, were extremely uh, against what I was trying to do and what the government was trying to do. And uh, at a Tory party conference in Blackpool, I remember that Julian Amory, who was now a friend of mine, had arranged for Hang Carrington banners to be put all around the hall of Blackpool, um, which was slightly putting off, but, but I, I got, you know, I won quite easily. Throughout her premiership, Africa and its politics would prove a diplomatic thorn in Mrs Thatcher's side. But a far more satisfactory relationship was to be had with the United States, and specifically Ronald Reagan. They met for the first time when Mrs Thatcher was leader of the opposition and he was Governor Reagan, and it was mutual admiration at first sight. She felt very feminine with him, and undoubtedly that was one of the many bases of the great strength of their relationship. Of course, there was politics involved in it too, but it really helped that they felt happy and content in each other's company. Reagan's first visit to London as president was during the Falklands War the first test for the special relationship. The US had led attempts to secure a diplomatic solution, but when it became clear the Argentines were unlikely to leave the Falklands of their own volition, President Reagan backed Britain's right to take back the Falklands, even if that meant using force. Jim? Mr. James, Mr. James Cullinan. And we have put up Wellington. Oh, And Nelson. Oh, that's very good. There you go. You're looking around to see what I've done. Mrs. Thatcher chose to express her gratitude with a lavish reception at Downing Street. I think they got on very well because they had basically the same. Uh, sort of values. President Reagan, who was a marvellous man, I, I, I got to like him, know him well, and got to like him very much, and he had a sort of magical personality, and, and the sort of, and he was very clever in getting people uh, working for him who were very good, uh, and, but he was full of common sense, but, but she was cleverer, 
uh, the, the, than him. Uh, and um, I think together they made a very good team. After talks the next day, the true extent of their high regard for one another was fulsomely expressed outside the front door at number 10. Altogether, if I may sum up, this has been a tremendously successful visit and one which we shall long remember both in our minds and in our hearts. This has been a most important meeting for us and a very heartwarming experience every minute that we've been here and we leave strengthened with the knowledge that the great friendship and the great alliance that has existed for so long between our two peoples, the United Kingdom and the United States, remains and is, if anything, stronger than it has ever been. So. Mr. President, could you, could you uh, tell us, uh, no. do you favor a multinational force to guarantee the future of the Falklands? She regarded Reagan as a very uh, promising uh, <laughs> ruler, but in constant need of, 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 of a little bit of guidance, you know, which had to be tactfully done. And she got this worked out very well. And he got it worked out very well. I mean, he, 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 he smiled at her a bit, you know, he, he, he joked about her a bit. But nevertheless, he respected her greatly, and it was a very good relationship. Reagan and Thatcher shared a mutual mistrust of communism. And during the early years of Mrs. Thatcher's premiership, relations with the Soviet Union were distinctly frosty. When she first became prime minister, I mean, she would have agreed entirely with President Reagan about the empire of evil. I mean, she felt that uh, the Soviet Union were thoroughly dangerous and, and aggressive and um, uh, and everything had to be done to make sure that they didn't succeed in their efforts. But with the death of the Soviet leader Yuri Andropov in early 1984, all this was to change. The surprising choice of the elderly and frail Konstantin Chernenko as successor gave Mrs. Thatcher a little longer to headhunt a future leader of the Soviet Empire. We concluded we couldn't expect to destroy the Soviet Union or undermine them. We had to find ways of changing their position. And we ought to see their leaders. And thanks to a good deal of effective, very effective staff work by the Foreign Office and others, the advice we got from around the world was that he was the man most likely to succeed, although he was then only the chairman of their Foreign Affairs Committee in the Duma. The meeting seems to have taken Anglo-Soviet relations into a new and better phase. Above all, it was an opportunity for the two leaders to size each other up. I hate communism. The very first word she says to it, I hate communism. The friendship blossomed. She was straight. December 1984 was notable for two other meetings that firmly established Mrs. Thatcher's presence on the global stage. The first was her visit to China to sign the Hong Kong Agreement, negotiations for which had started two years earlier. It looked on the face of it very difficult, and it was. But the key to success was the vision of Jiang Chaping, the Chinese leader. His four words, one country, two systems. His recognition that if sovereignty was to go back to China, as it had to do, we only had a lease on our own argument, it ought to go back in working order. And that meant it had to go on as a capitalist society, free society. And the job was to turn those four words into the 8,000-word joint declaration, which is still in force today, shaping Hong Kong for the next 40 years. We are privileged today to take part with our Chinese friends in a unique occasion. The circumstances are unique. The agreement is unique. It is right that we should feel a sense of history, of pride, and of confidence in the future. And I thank you for the privilege of doing this. At a time when there was considerable tension between the superpowers, Mrs. Thatcher pointed to the Hong Kong Agreement as an example of what can be achieved by negotiation. Both sides want America and Russia to take note that if Britain and China can solve their differences by talking, the two superpowers ought to do the same. The world can draw a lesson from the successful outcome of our joint enterprise. 
that determined negotiation can succeed, her confrontation would surely lead to disaster. That goodwill and friendship can overcome misunderstanding. Three days later, Mrs. Thatcher arrived in the United States, having invited herself to meet the president at Camp David. Out in his cashmere sweater and slacks, presidential watchers here say he hasn't kissed her before. He did today, before leading her to his suitably lunar buggy to conduct her away for talks. And though the discussions ranged from Ethiopia through Lebanon to Ulster, they were dominated in the end by Mr. Gorbachev's London visit and the issue of Star Wars. The special relationship had been sealed with a kiss, but that didn't stop the flirtation with Gorbachev. When Chernenko died the following March, Gorbachev became leader. Mrs. Thatcher flew to Moscow for the funeral and had a lengthy meeting with Gorbachev. And all the heads of government going there were given 15 minutes in the Kremlin to make a formal session with him. And George Bush, senior, the vice president, was there for America. He got his 15 minutes. Margaret got 45 minutes, and one could see the relationship between them was a very personal one, and very, very important. A year later, and Mrs. Thatcher was Gorbachev's ambassador to the G7 summit of 1986. It was she who, aboard her plane, carried the personal letter from Mr. Gorbachev, promising renewed interest in an East-West summit this year. The trust displayed in her by the Russian leader was matched by the praise of the US president. Mrs. Thatcher had just a month before allowed Reagan to use British bases to launch airstrikes on Libya in retaliation for a fatal attack on US servicemen in West Berlin, which intelligence blamed on a Gaddafi-backed terrorist group. We recognized the Americans had suffered an attack by terrorists under Libyan direction, the explosion of a bomb in the Berlin nightclub. They were entitled to take action in self-defense. Their initial reaction which is not unique, was to say, we've got to respond to this, and respond as American for retaliate. International law doesn't allow for retaliation. So we spent the best part of a week discussing it with the Americans to persuade them that it had to be done in self-defense with limited targets, so as, so as to avoid uh, killing, injuring more people than was absolutely essential. Mr. President, are you satisfied that if uh, you have to ask Mrs. Thatcher to give you permission to use the bomber bases again. She'll be able to give it to you. All I know is that I am most grateful to her for making it possible uh, this time that she did. There could be no clearer indication that by now, Mrs. Thatcher was an old hand dominating proceedings. The American president's enthusiasm for her had never been in doubt. That she could dominate the others began to become clear that evening as she seized upon questions directed at Canada's Premier Mulroney about the rocket attack which had deposited debris in his embassy forecourt. You think of those rockets thrown at your embassy? We're not thinking, of, you're, they're far more in your mind than ours here. Yeah. We're not worried about them. Uh, just don't exaggerate them. All right? Got the message? But not all those present at the summit appreciated her style or dominance. I don't think it's that we, we don't uh, uh, appreciate her intelligence. I think she's very condescending, very haughty, very arrogant. Uh, she treats the press very contemptuously. And I think that when you get that kind of treatment, you kind of return it in kind. What no one in any of the national camps assembled here finds it easy to do is to attempt an explanation of Mrs. Thatcher's hit rating here against the findings of opinion polls back home. Running in parallel and closer to home was the issue of the European community. Ironically, when she came into office, Mrs. Thatcher and the Conservatives were considered more pro-European than Labour. Uh, Margaret was perfectly pro-European when she took over. You can find quotations talking about putting us at the heart of Europe and so on. She had spoken up in favour of membership, uh, both in government and opposition before. She campaigned in favour of membership in Wilson's referendum, she formed a very pro-European government and we pursued very pro-European policies. Mrs. Thatcher was all in favor of greater European cooperation, but she made it clear from the start she was determined to reduce the size of the British contribution to community funds. Although an initial reduction was achieved within a year of her taking office, the budget row would continue to dominate European summits for several years thereafter. There was a whole series of meetings. It seemed to go on forever, this discussion about the budget. and it. And it soured our relations with the European Union. I mean, we, it started off, I remember going off on 
when I first became Foreign Secretary to a foreign minister's meeting and uh, trying to, you see, the previous government hadn't had much, much more luck than we did about the budget and uh, trying to smooth things over, but it, um, it was really impossible to do and uh, we, we never really recovered, I don't think, our, uh, our um, collaboration with Europe at the time as a result of this, but it was, I think, inevitable. A deal was finally secured at Fontainebleau in June 1984. Is this the best deal you think you could have got? Yes, I think it is a, it is a good settlement for Britain, um, better than I had hoped to come away with today from Fontainebleau. I could always have hoped for a bigger percentage. Uh, one can always do that. But all things considered, it's very reasonable. And I think it's very good coming at the present time. We could do with some good news. And it just shows that when the only weapon is persuasion, when the only thing you can do is get together, the politicians can get together, can negotiate, can agree. It would be nice if other people would take the hint. I was actually with her as Foreign Secretary in 1984 at Fontainebleau when we, when we did get the result. And even there we had to stick out for the last 2 or 3%. It was necessary to do it with that kind of determination. So I think that if you're going to be serious about trying to get, to get a position changed, it's a great asset, actually, for people to know you mean what you say. With the budget settled, at least for the foreseeable future, there were other issues that occupied the European community. Enlargement and moves towards closer integration in a form termed the single market. She signed the Single European Act, for which she is totally maligned today. Um, why? because she joined the common market. She thought she'd joined the common market. And she signed the Single European Act with all kinds of opt-outs, which are now described as red lines, um, to, in order to get more quickly into lucrative French and German financial markets. That was the objective of the exercise. The pet Eurosceptic theory was that she hadn't understood it. I've never heard such nonsense in all my life. The one thing about Margaret was, A, she's got a good mind, B, she immerses herself in detail. She understood perfectly well what she was doing. Uh, and she was an enthusiast. I mean, it was all of a piece with uh, the, the, the you know, political philosophy of the government. We were removing barriers to trade. We were moving towards free trade. We believed it would be beneficial for the economies of all the member states, including the United Kingdom. And without her personal leadership, I think the European Council would have taken years to get round to the, what became a very rapid process of deregulation. The single market settled work on economic and monetary union, the EMU, now gathered pace. In raising objections, Mrs Thatcher liked to characterise it as Britain versus the Brussels bureaucracy. She accused the European Commission of trying to take more and more power. I think she had a pretty fair idea that the social democracy of Europe was undermining her very good capitalist work in Britain. So there was a an increasingly uneasy relationship and she didn't like the way it was going down the federal route. Now you can argue, as I have myself, that she did a great deal to give the European Union the ambition to advance. The only trouble was it went down the wrong route from her point of view towards federalism rather than towards a much looser uh, uh, collection of nations trading and cooperating freely with each other but not being run from Brussels in a federal manner. If disharmony characterised Mrs Thatcher's dealings with European leaders, she thought herself by contrast very much in tune with the American and Soviet heads of state. So when in October 1986 Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev held talks on nuclear disarmament in Iceland without her, Mrs Thatcher was somewhat miffed, not to say a little alarmed. Reagan's own Secretary of State was concerned as well, because he, he looked as though he was going to sell the shop, as it were, without having got proper agreement on the very difficult details that had to be hammered out. But simply to say let both sides abandon every nuclear weapon at the drop of a hat would have created a very insecure situation, and particularly so for America's European allies, who depended 
on the American deterrent as one of their main protections against the Soviet bloc. The talks in Reykjavik broke down without agreement. Afterwards, Mrs. Thatcher wasted no time in flying to Washington to correct the president's misguided views on nuclear disarmament. Reagan was chastened, and there were many in the American administration who were grateful for the intervention. And when Margaret intervened on that, it wasn't that she was against arms control, but she was against an impulsive, uh, not very well-defined gesture. It, it, it was something that Ronald Reagan had conceded, which was in the right spirit, but was in danger of going the wrong way too far. Mrs. Thatcher saw no contradiction between her defense of the nuclear deterrent and her burgeoning friendship with Mikhail Gorbachev. She saw them rather as two sides of the same coin, keeping the Russian bear in check while encouraging it to open up and do business with the West. Naturally, when she was invited to visit the Soviet Union in 1987, she leapt at the chance. It was the first visit by a British Prime Minister for a very, very long time. And it was taking advantage of the good personal relationship. And she had the great advantage of being a woman because she was instantly recognisable. So that going around Moscow or wherever in a large uh, Soviet-style car, she could be seen, people recognised her, they waved at her and she, she stopped the car and got out and went out to talk to people. And things. They were delighted to have her around as a symbol of an opening up, if you like. Back in the West, Ronald Reagan seemed finally to forget his non-nuclear aberration and in early 1988 returned to NATO to fully endorse its latest agreement on weapons, although he seemed a little vague on the detail. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. 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 We saw it last night. Oh, yeah. no problem. That's very good. Yes, very good. No problem. Chief of Staff Howard Baker prompting a sudden recollection, but very good was a sentiment Mrs. Thatcher agreed with. Not all within NATO were quite so keen. Germany, particularly, was reluctant to agree on the modernization of nuclear weapons, a position about which Mrs. Thatcher had strong views. There's no possibility of clearing the planet of nuclear weapons by the year 2000, nor in the end at all, because, after all, two world wars have shown us that conventional weapons are not enough to deter war. And if we want a war-free Europe, then we must continue to have a nuclear deterrent. If you're to deter war, if you're to have an effective alliance, you don't do it with obsolete weapons. Therefore, you have to modernize. That is not in doubt. They all believe it. Some of them are really rather shy in saying it as openly as we are. It's not in the declaration in quite the way that you've been putting it, though, Prime Minister. It, it does not use the word modernize, and it actually uses this phrase, uh, keep up to date where necessary, which surely is open to all sorts of interpretations. Of course it isn't. But you're splitting hairs. This is ridiculous. These weapons will continue to be kept up to date because the whole policy of the Alliance is a sure defense, deterrence sufficient to deter any aggressor. Do you understand the misgivings that the Germans express about being left as the only obvious battlefield in which these modernized battlefield nuclear weapons might be used? If you're on the front line, then if they cross that front line, of course you would be the first victim unless you won every battle. So it's bad luck still being be... German, in a sense. No, no, no. Look, look at history. You can't deny history. You can't deny that it was Hitler that created the last world war and who had to be defeated. And the German freedom started the day the West won. They know that. That is their geography, that is their history, they are on the front line, and the greater their resolve to deter, the greater the certainty of their peace will be. She was very, very unfair to Germany, and that was, that was related to her wartime uh, childhood. I mean, she really never warmed Germany, and although Germany, I think, is probably the most changed country in the world, actually, in terms of having put its past behind it, she never appreciated that. She always saw behind the face of Herr Kohl the skull of Hitler. And that was very unfair because, you know, whether one liked Herr Kohl or not, he had been that part of the democratization of Germany. The strained relationship between the German and British leaders was graphically illustrated by dummies aboard a float in the Cologne Carnival of February 1989. 
Everyone was expecting what Europeans have come to term a diplomatic handbagging over Germany's failure to agree to the modernization of short-range nuclear weapons. But instead, later that month, the Anglo-German summit was all smiles and diplomacy. Mrs. Thatcher exchanged gifts with Dr. Cole, and having peered through the wrong end of the opera glasses he'd given her, proceeded to inform us through the usual channels that she could now see no reason why they should not be in full agreement on nuclear decisions. Well, I think she did realize that she just would, mustn't let her latent anti-Germanic feelings ever escape in public. So I think, in a, in a sense, she overcompensated. She, she liked people whose uh, native language was English. Um, and so the Americans and the Australians and the New Zealanders and so on were, were much more, to her mind, good r rather than Europeans. I don't think it was particularly against Germany, but she, you know, I think she had a sort of wariness about, uh, about Italians and French and Germans and so on. Nine months later, East Germany announced the opening of its border with the West. On the 10th of November, the Berlin Wall started to fall. The demise of communism in East Germany was not an isolated event. 1989 was the year the Eastern Bloc began falling apart. From Poland to Romania, communism collapsed. However, while such news was music to the ears of Mrs. Thatcher, the prospect of German reunification caused her some disquiet. One of the things about Margaret Thatcher is that she had her, uh, her own her, her preconceived ideas, certainly about Germany, derived from the war. Um, but she wasn't, because she's an, such an honest, intellectually honest person, she wasn't content simply to be left with her own ideas. She wanted to get support for them. So she summoned what became a famous seminar, Czechos, on Germany. She got all the experts on Germany from all over the country. She gathered them at Czechos. And she expected them, and she led them in this direction, to say that German unity would be a disaster, and that, that the worst side of the German character would come out. Um, and they didn't. Uh, and the, 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 the seminar became a disappointment for her. But it was interesting that she, she felt the need for it. And um, that is the intellectual honesty in her. She was always trying to buttress her own ideas with outside um, uh, opinion. 1989 also witnessed the first visit by Mikhail Gorbachev to Downing Street, and two months later, the first visit by a new American president, George Bush. Both occasions were marked by warm words and even humor. Mrs. Thatcher said that we talked for two and a half hours. I должен опровергнуть и сказать, что мы беседовали с десяти часов, не прерываясь, даже тогда, когда шел завтрак. But I must deny that. I must say that we began talking at 10 a.m. and then we continued until this very moment without even breaking up for lunch, Это breaking не... our conversation for Это lunch. And that's just uh, a small precision. Prime Minister, my sincere thanks to you for a very encouraging and uh, frank exchange that we had. It's only with friends that you can take off the gloves and talk from the heart. And uh, I felt that I was with a friend today, and I can assure the people in the United Kingdom that from our side of the Atlantic, this relationship is strong and uh, will continue to be. If Mrs. Thatcher regretted the loss of Ronald Reagan, she did her very best not to show it. It became, in effect, a special family party celebrating a special family-style relationship. Well, Mrs. Thatcher was used to her relationship with Reagan. Along came Bush, whom she didn't particularly know. He was a very nice man, very, very competent and so on, no doubt about it. But she hadn't got that relationship. And, and then he, he strongly supported the unification of uh, Germany and, and resisted her sort of warnings about it. Um, and so it wasn't the same. But she learned. The next year, Mrs. Thatcher paid a return visit to Moscow. By now, Anglo-Soviet relations were at their height. Mrs. Thatcher sought to reassure Gorbachev, who had his own reservations regarding German unification, and congratulated the Soviet leader on his recent agreement with President Bush to destroy most chemical weapons. As to what was happening on Russia's domestic front, Mrs. Thatcher could only find praise. 
Yes, well, some things might go wrong, but I don't think they'll all go wrong. And if they might go wrong, then I think that what he deserves from us is support in this tremendous thing that he's doing, which is the most exciting thing in this half century. It's most exciting. It's not a thing you want to say, but won't this, that, and the other go wrong? It's a thing which you want to say, well, some things will go wrong, but let's see that we get through and win through. They had a very good relationship, undoubtedly, but his situation was so different from hers that although certainly he may have been encouraged to think, I'm sure he's encouraged to think that there was a real possibility of a coming together with the West. But I think the key things, which are Perestroika and Glasnost, were not largely influenced by Mrs Thatcher. What is certainly true is that Mrs Thatcher, in her premiership, became a figure of magnetic influence throughout the whole Eastern Europe and Russia because they saw her as being the apostle of capitalism. And in that sense, she was tremendously influential as a figure around which public opinion gathered. But I'm not sure that one can describe her as being, in a sense, the author of his policies. I think he was the author of his own policies. Unbeknown then to Mrs. Thatcher, this would be her last visit as Prime Minister to Russia. The storm clouds foretelling her departure from office were gathering. But there was still time to settle a diplomatic score and influence the course of someone else's war. In July 1990, Nelson Mandela met Mrs. Thatcher in London. Throughout her years as Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher had been at odds with those Commonwealth countries who wanted tough sanctions imposed on the apartheid government of South Africa. She did claim to put pressure on the South African government to release Nelson Mandela from prison, but she didn't believe sanctions worked. She is an enemy of apartheid. Our differences are in regard to the methods of inducing the government to dismantle apartheid. And as I say, I regard this meeting as being productive, and I come away uh, full of strength and hope. She didn't really resonate with the feelings about, um, as it were, racial oppression. I won't say, I, mean, I don't, there's no evidence that she's a racist, but I don't think there's any evidence either that her natural sympathies lay with liberation movements. They clearly didn't. And uh, I don't think she probably thought of the Commonwealth as being more than a lovely ornament for the Queen in a way. I mean, not as something that was central to her politics. Whether the South African government was swayed in its decision to release Mandela by Mrs. Thatcher is unclear. But on an event one month later, she is said to have had a direct influence. When the president of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, invaded Kuwait and declared it an Iraqi territory, Mrs. Thatcher was in Aspen, Colorado, at a gathering with President Bush. I don't think she made American policy, but I think she brought forward the moment when Bush said this aggression of Iraq against Kuwait must not stand. She was on the telephone to me often from Aspen. She was frightfully cross. She was stuck there uh, when she should be back in, in, in England. But actually, there at that time, I think she did, a, she did a very good job. Three months later, Mrs. Thatcher would leave office. Her dance upon the stage of international politics would be over. There had, of course, been other foreign issues with which she was concerned during her 11 years in power. Working with her foreign secretaries, she had, for example, led peace talks in Cambodia and between Zimbabwe and Mozambique. She did her best to influence the spread of democracy and the free market throughout Eastern Europe. But it is her relationship with the leaders of the two superpowers, the USA and the former Soviet Union, for which she will best be remembered. It was an extraordinary combination that you had a leader in Britain and a leader in America who saw the way that the world was developing, that great divide that had split the world, the Cold War over so many years. Two leaders who saw the solution to that, the resolution to that in very similar terms. It made them very formidable as a pair and it made Maggie Thatcher's role in ending the Cold War a, a very significant one, much more so than perhaps any other Prime Minister of Great Britain could possibly have expected to achieve. In the next programme, how Mrs Thatcher handled terrorism, unrest and dissent at home.
you can order Margaret Thatcher, a tribute in words and pictures, for the special half-price fee of £10. Call Telegraph Books on 0870 155 722 or order online at www.books.telegraph.co.uk.